a month. Um, and if you're wondering, I am coding, competing, and I hope to win and really want to push the limits. Um, so this today uh, is really about classroom to uh, corporate. So things I thought you'd like to know just to start is, well, first, my name is Michael, um, and I am a College Park graduate, so I'm a huge Terps fan, so go Terps. Uh, unfortunately, I couldn't find my uh, Maryland uh, hoodie. It literally is lost somewhere. Anyway, um, so despite graduating in finance, my career has primarily been in software engineering, and I can proudly say that in my, all my career, I've always been trying to reach new heights and truly believe the sky is the limit. Um, from the classroom, I went from startups to mid-sized companies to large-sized companies in a range of fields, ranging from advertising, media, health and wellness, to today being at Fannie Mae, uh, which is one of the largest financial institutions that everyone most likely has heard of, but perhaps don't know what we do. Um, unless you've been to our booth, in which case John is probably giving you an education on what we do. So some of you most likely are in a home or apartment um, that's backed or um, financed by the Federal National Mortgage Association, known as Fannie Mae. It's an acronym. Um, last year, fun fact, uh, one out of four single family homes were purchased or refinanced through Fannie Mae. Isn't that cool? So Fannie is in, oh, we gotta go to the next slide. I am not doing a good job on this one. How do I go to the next slide on this? Arrow key. Ah, I'm gonna click the screen. Okay, cool. See, I may be in technology, but AV is not my thing. Um, so Fannie is in what's called the secondary mortgage market. Um, we are fundamentally a really powerful, smart risk management solution. Um, Fannie, buys loans from lenders, which we then package into guaranteed mortgage-backed securities that we then sell to investors. This guarantee enables our investors to feel confident uh, what they're investing in, and it helps the housing in industry as a whole because it brings quality, uh, sustainability, and affordable equity in all housing. So the thing about Fannie is we're always looking for ways to help with the mortgage process. We need to find a way to make it simpler, faster, safer, and less expensive. And one primary way to do that is through technology. All right, I'm going to skip one more slide here. So the group I support is called Finance Technology. And our CFO likes to call our group, call, likes to call finance the caboose of, of the company. If you're familiar with the caboose on a train, it does everything to make sure the train doesn't go flying off the rails. And you have to make sure that everybody gets on board the train. And so that, that's, that's the safety and soundness that finance technology brings to the firm. Our work in finance ranges from everything from internal finance, such as expenses, payroll, uh, costs, and procurement. On the other side, we support all the rigorous accounting processes necessary to support, get this, a $4 trillion balance sheet. Um, Meaningful strategic planning is really important if you're going to be able to manage that balance sheet, as well as providing financial actuals, which we can then feed into our forecasting and modeling system. This actual data going into forecasting is very important because guess what? It helps understand home buying confidence. It helps better understand how interest rates are going to be impacting our wealth, how inflation, how the market's going to be able to sustain a continuing growth, uh, growth in the housing industry. So we have cool technology at Fannie Mae, so you should apply. But um, our rationalized technologies embrace open and inner source technologies and strategies. We believe, and this is the, this is the big gotcha because we're not a startup, we have to be mature enough to support our security and reliability needs. So while we do use a lot of open source and we do inner source a lot at Fannie Mae, we do use the stuff that's been actually been proven. Um, as much as we would like to experiment with more, uh, we do need to think about safety and soundness as one of our primary concerns. Okay. So. As an example of how we use all of this cool technology, um, there's two examples. We use machine learning and data analytics quite significantly. This helps us with topics such as diversity and inclusion. I know that's near and dear to everybody's heart in, this, on, in today. And also housing resiliency in the face of climate change. So these are two examples. On a diversity and inclusion side, how do we ensure fair and equal access to housing? In other words, how do we increase financial literacy for all Americans? How do we democratize information across the entire industry? And lastly, and this is really the most important part, is 
How do we tear down the barriers being put on communities who can't participate in the home buying experience? And quite frankly, home buying is still the American dream. How do we create that wealth creation process for all Americans? So fact, <clears throat> LMI, uh, the lower to middle income families spent $127 billion on financial services last year. Has that led to increased ROI, return on investment for them? Uh, has it continued to involve more LMI, lower to middle income families in the home buying experience? These are the things that we're trying to solve. On the climate front, we all know this, right? Tornadoes, hurricanes, uh, fires, flooding, these are all becoming more and more factors. So how do we use our data insights to determine the risk of homes uh, most likely to suffer from these kind of events? Um, with these better insights, we can better protect homes that are out there today. Okay. I, I've only got a couple more slides and then uh, I will answer questions. Uh, FinTech supports a broad range of modern technology. You would probably think a company founded in 1938, 85 years old, would be nothing but boring mainframes and COBOL. We do have mainframes, we do have COBOL, but we have a lot of cool stuff too. On the right rail, you're seeing our cloud strategy at work. It's a sampling of our cloud strategy. Um, we are moving towards a serverless approach where we can leverage compute and energy we need uh, not only to meet the, the, the growing needs for the company from a performance perspective, but also reduce our environmental impact. With the introduction of finance technology evolution with uh, tokenization, distributed ledgers, cryptocurrencies, the advent of stable coins, increasing regulations, the, the, the continuing decentralized identities, the pace of innovation in the finance space the need to more rapidly integrate these into the economic system using technology to move from experimental into Fanny, we need to be at the front of that curve. So this wildly complex slide is how all of these complex data integrations uh, need to work in harmony to meet the challenge of innovation. Then FinTech continues to push the boundaries of our data strategy by leveraging machine learning, adopting data mesh frameworks, and enabling what we call citizen development um, to enable simple and secure access without bottlenecks. Our goal in finance is to get to continuous finance, right? Um, the days of multi-day closes, the, the days of where data is uh, a bottleneck, we want to get away from that. We want actual data and forecasting data to work simultaneously, instantly to adapt to changing market conditions and regulatory um, changes. In closing, I hope you learned a little bit about Fannie Mae today. And if you wanna learn more, stop at the booth and you can find out more. So one of the things I want you to walk away with is that many of you may think uh, when you came into this meeting, uh, into this workshop that this big lumbering 85 year old company uh, was slow and stymied in legacy tech. I hope today, you're seeing, you're getting a taste of how Fannie um, is breaking that perception and uh, reaching new heights. Um, so have fun at Technica. Any questions? Yes. Data hygiene is a big issue, right? And so I'm not going to say that we're perfect on the ML front. What we are doing is something, or our first strategy is built around something called a data mesh. And one of the core tenets of a data mesh is you want to focus on data gravity. So to your point, a lot of that data that you're talking about is in a whole of different places. The public data is in multiple different locations. It's literally called public for a reason. Um, we want to figure out like, from a gravity perspective, can we put it into one data mesh or one data store? If we do that, if we understand the single source of truth, then we can start pulling that information together and, and intertwining that and figuring out what that output ultimately needs to be from a forecasting perspective. So I hear you. It's not out there yet. We are getting there though. So on a positive note, so I'm going to brag a little bit about my team. Over the last three years, we did this thing called um, general ledger transformation. And what we did was we took our 25-year-old ledger, which is our accounting system, right? Uh, and that includes payables, receivables, and our entire sub-ledger system, really complex. And 
You may not think a, a, a ledger system is that complex, but you have to understand that Fannie Mae supports $4 trillion um, and, and that those loans alone is a big transactional concern. We did over the last three years, we overhauled all of that and consolidated everything into one data mesh. So now my CFO has all of her actual information um, in one location in one data mesh. And so that she can actually pull that and bring it into her forecasting in a much more seamless way. Because the question that you're ultimately asking is, if we knew that some of the housing industry was gonna get a little weaker this year, if we knew that inflation and interest rates was coming, what, what, were there things that Fannie Mae could have done better? Absolutely. And so that's the one thing that we wanted to try to solve for is how do we make that better? Does that answer your question? All right, cool. Hi. Yeah. Stable coin. So compliance and ethics would get if get me in trouble if I said too much. But um, I here's what I will say is that we do have we are experimenting quite a bit on distributed ledger. So back to my point about how do we get to continuous finance? Distributed ledger is one way to guarantee that. And we can do that through smart contracts and we can uh, build a better ledger that's, that, that really has guaranteed rapid nonstop access for all of our accountants, as well as all of our forecast and modeling folks. So take that aside. Let's face the reality. Cryptocurrency and the, and the regulator's interest in stablecoin is continuing to become a more pervasive issue on the table. Um, and so I think that those are going to be fully recognized at some point. Um, I am not an investor, so don't take my advice, please, please. I'm a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a geek at the end of the day. But I do believe that the regulators are going to um, appreciate and accept the fact that stablecoin and cryptocurrency is definitely going to be one of the currencies we're going to have to support in the future. Does that answer your question? Cool. Yeah. Yeah. So let me just say this. I am not an expert in finance. So I have a finance degree, but that was back in, <clears throat> don't age, I'm, I'm going to age myself a little bit. That's from 1995. So, um, uh, so I was previously at Walt Disney Company and I was in the media space with a whole bunch of creatives. That was a different set of, of challenges. And I, when I came over into the finance technology space, I was like, is this something that I really want to do? I mean, to your point, it's a bunch of numbers. I mean, it's big numbers, a lot of pressure. If you get it wrong, you're in big trouble. Um, don't want to go to jail. Um, and, but when I got into the space, I realized there's a tremendous amount of creativity that's going on in the finance space. All the things that I mentioned with ledgers, cryptocurrency, this space is getting upheaval. There's a tremendous amount of upheaval in this space. The culture is transforming. They need this, they need creativity more than they actually need the, um, the rigor um, that people are talking about. Don't get me wrong, safety and soundness absolutely gotta be key, right? When you talk, so bottom line, when you talk about a double entry ledger system, uh, everyone's taking accounting one-on-one? Everybody, no, not so much. Um, debits have to equal credits. That, that's the fundamental thing. That, that's the fundamental truth that has to happen. But how we get there, there's a lot of, there's a lot of excitement that's going on in space right now. Um, so it, this is a very exciting space to be in. And by the way, it, what makes it more exciting, in, in case you're thinking about applying, is this is one of the largest financial institutions um, out there. This is this is a great space to be in. It's a great culture. It's a great culture. Very it, um, very good culture. Yes. Yeah. So get this. Uh, is your question how did I, how did I end up in software? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I was really excited about finance. Um, I actually got my Series 7, Series 63. I was going to be an investment banker. I was going to move to New York and all this great stuff. Um, but then I saw everybody like um, getting stressed out and it was, it, was, it, was, it, was, um, it was not for me. And then I discovered this thing called the World Wide Web in 1996. And that changed everything for me. Um, so I was very fortunate um, to, to have an opportunity at NASDAQ, NASD, to build their first NASDAQ.com website. So it was the best job ever because I got to take my interest in the web, um, interest in databases, interested in SQL, interested in uh, C, um, and take my finance background and bring that to NASDAQ.com. And at the time, it was one of the first 
high transaction um, website sellers out there. Um, today, it pales in comparison to Amazon.com, which gets like 12 million queries per microsecond. But um, it, at the time, it was pretty exciting. We, Nasdaq.com in 1996 got uh, 15 million transactions a day. <laughs> but I think the point that I'm trying to make is that we live in a world now where the sky is the limit. It's like, if you, you, you should try something and if you don't like it, move on to the next thing and keep trying something that until you find something that you can really sink your teeth into. And then once you've sunk your teeth into it and learned everything you can, move on to the next thing. I went from media to health and wellness to advertising to finance technology. <laughs> I don't even have to tell you about my career journey. I started off as a developer. I was a developer for six years, uh, moving into systems integration, uh, moved into security, quality assurance. I was actually doing hardware design for a while. I've tried almost every field possible in technology. Yeah, try everything. That's that's my motto. Yeah. So so okay, you guys. I'm gonna. I'm sorry, not you guys, but um, you have so many benefits that I didn't have in 1995. You have IDEs. Back in 1995, you know what our IDE was? It was VI. Do you guys even know what VI is? VI is? Yeah. See, right. I had I had a text editor that I had to develop all my code in. And oh, by the way, you got you you have Python. You have you have these great scripting languages today. I had compiled code. You know how frustrating it is to try to compile C and then try to find that one thing that you messed up on, figure out where that one object was. That's very very frustrating. You have debuggers. You had I didn't have debuggers back then. Um, so to your question, yes, everything I did I learned on my own. But my point is this: is that today what you have is this amazing access to libraries, uh, reusable code. This thing called Google, um, YouTube, like it's amazing the preponderance of information you have um, and access that you have. Like the things that you can do today are going to be that are amazing in terms of what I was able to do versus what uh, uh, today's generation can do. Yeah, the innovation that's happening is is insane. It's insane right now. Any other questions? I see we still got fifteen minutes. Oh come on! You see, you promised me. You promised me thirty-five. Anybody? Is everybody excited? Everybody's going to apply to Fannie Mae? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, please. I'm a computer science major. I don't have a background in finance, but I was wondering if your company or institution you're thinking about could address additional digital science on the computer side. So we're, it's funny when I said the creativity that we're looking for, in some ways, not being in finance is actually a strength. And here's why, because you can bring outside the box thinking into, into Fannie Mae, and we need more of that to really figure out how we're going to be able to adjust this to the market. So having finance experience is cool because it gives you at least a leg up on understanding how Fannie works, but I don't think it's the end all be all. For example, like I said, I come from the media background. I didn't, I didn't have financial institution background. So, but over the last several years, I've really worn myself into the space. And I, I like to think that I actually brought some outside the box ideas. Some of the, the what we call business consumer uh, perspectives that we see in, at Disney uh, into the B2P space, the business to business space, which is what Fannie's in. Yeah, so don't let it hold you back. I just want to add most so I, I don't want to sound um, disingenuous, but the diversity and inclusion and psychological safety and the culture that Fannie Mae builds, really, I, I truly, I've never seen this before, where it, it really is a value and a norm that we live by at, at Fannie. Um, because here's the thing, is that the finance space may have, a, you know, you read about them in the Wall Street Journal every week, but I can, say, I can say with absolute certainty that Fannie really, because we influence the market so much, we bring such a moral high ground, a moral standard, and an ethical standard that we we can actually influence the, the rest of the regular the, the rest of the finance industry in ways that um, I've never seen before, which is just remarkable. So, 
Yeah. Anybody else? All right, um, I'm gonna take over now. So if nobody else has any questions, um, let's just give Michael and Fannie Mae a big round of applause for doing here. Amazing workshop. Oh, okay. I think Kat does want to say something, so I'll hand the mic off to her. Um, but just real quick, before you guys um do leave, we do have to get your um cards punched to give you credit for the workshop. So if everyone could just take their cards out of their little case, that would be very helpful. And then um my 